the book I have been working on for more than 10 years is full of conjecture, because that is the nature of its subject matter. There is no way to ask those who died centuries or millennia ago how they lived and what they thought and felt, what they dreamed and what they fantasized about, and if we ask contemporaries this, then we have no way to find out whether they are not lying to us or whether they are not lying to themselves, there is some techniques, but not enough for complete security. The difficult task I have set myself in this text is related to my conviction that the inexplicable can still be explained without ceasing to be inexplicable, one can rationally argue why it is inexplicable, in which aspects it is inexplicable and in what will always remain unexplained and why. I find this necessary to bridge the dissociating rift between our thoughts and our feelings, between the intuitive and the empirical. I strive for abstract words to cease to be abstract for those who read carefully, for example, by translating them into Bulgarian, or presenting them with a set of synonyms, explaining their meaning logically, or illustrating them with concrete examples from life. For example, the abstract epithet, spiritual and spiritual, which I introduce as an explanatory term for certain characteristics of human life, for me is roughly synonymous with mental and cultural, spiritual equals mental, translated from Greek, cultural means ennobled in translation from Latin, and in our language the expression, spiritual sphere, is generally synonymous with, cultural sphere. As another explanatory translation of the same epithet, I have used the expression, mentally cultivated, i.e. built, nurtured, ennobled, and spiritualized, elevated equals, sublimated, through the psyche, not through anything else, be it body, DNA, or state laws. And this means that cultivation as a transformation occurs in the mental life, or in a peace of mind, of the particular person, in the context of his community with others. The level of the, soulful and spiritual, or, mental cultivated, in us gives rise to the, superworld, of human communities, the, human superworld. In in this case I use the particle, over, to emphasize that this is a world that is also physical, but not only, and exists, but not only and is realized, but not only. Therefore, not only, by analogy I characterize, the human soul and spiritual superworld, and with the metaphor, quantum. This means that in this superworld many things have not been realized, not yet, or will not be at all, because it is a world and of dreams and projects for the future. Some of these dreams of ours have already come true, others have not come true at all and there is still more to come t to be realized, while others are only dreams, unrelated to goals and tasks, not leading to concrete activity. But most of them are in process, they have been implemented and are being implemented, but only partially and only to some extent, the activity of their development is yet to come. In other words, these processes can also be defined as living, that is, those that develop and evolve. So, for example, our, mental and spiritual, that is, mentally cultivated, activity, riding a bicycle, goes through the following stages, dream of being able to ride a bicycle, learning to ride a bicycle, perfecting riding a bicycle. At each stage of this process, cycling, is not fully accomplished, it is, cycling, but not quite, because it is not definitively finished as a possibility for realization, there is still room for development. Only when the cyclist dies, only then does, riding a bicycle, become completely complete, deterministic, because it cannot continue, as far as you learn to ride, there, and that's it. Because the end is coming, but even the end is not quite, because in the meantime you have taught or inspired others to ride a bicycle, and they continue your, biking, after you, and instead of you. What this means to me is that riding a bicycle is a, hyperreal, phenomenon, that is, it is real but it is also more than real, because besides having achieved it somewhat, it always includes dreams of riding better, more joyfully, better, more magical, and also plans and projects how to make driving even better, leading to processes of learning and development and improvement of this activity, as well as a potential opportunity to drive even better, well or even more differently than anyone has done before. That is why for me riding a bicycle is a psychically cultivated hyperreality, it is real, but not only and not completely, because it can still be improved, due to the peculiarities of our inner, personal, soul life, and because of its refinement over generations, within the framework of our spiritual, that is, cultural, tradition. The way in which this very special, semi-existent and almost existent, characteristic of human activity is carried out, 
the creation of an always unfinished superworld, including its invisible levels, those that remain only potential, inside the soul, in the thoughts, in the feelings, in the dreams, in the head and in the heart nd in our action is, communicating with oneself, with others and with the world. And the sphere they create in our environment is the planetary anthroposphere, the sphere of human activity on our planet. As to the essayistic character of my style and reasonings, as well as to the not infrequent pathos characteristic of them, they are due to my conviction that feelings and moral judgments are necessary to all meaningful thought about the human world. By their very nature, moral feelings and judgments are not emotions, and do not make the reasoning and expository ones emotional, or incorrect in their bias. I find rather that they make them alive and meaningful, humanly meaningful, including in terms of value. What is a text about the dreams of man and what is it for, if there are no feelings of hope, of love of life, of love for the world and or for people, if there are no feelings of faith and trust, of trust, of empathy or how about a happy and joking wink. Feelings do not contradict thought, on the contrary, feelings are the evaluative, and therefore, meaning-making, aspect of thought. I do not find it proper, nor necessary, nor adequate nor timely to deprive the scientific type of the text and from an uncompromising ethical position on some issues, which cannot and should not be discussed fluently, this would be a betrayal of our loved ones, to the children, our future, to self, to others, and to the world. Scientific thinking about man is of a primordial human nature. Even Aristotle claimed that science should be a unity of ethos pathos logos, of morality, feelings, and thought. The purpose of this book is scientific, and scientific educational precisely in such a context that integrates the integrity of the person, as a kind of renewed look at the foundation of human sciences. And their foundation, this is the person himself, a being capable of building living symbolic worlds in his communication. They can be defined as superrealities because they are superimposed on the sense-perceived reality. But at the same time, being most often invisible to the eyes, they are also tangibly real, because they are embodied in the person himself, in his value choices, in his actions and behavior, in his thought, in his moral feelings and in his identity and self-awareness, in his relationships with others and with everything else. They are also reflected in the field of his activity, which is able to significantly transform both the social and the natural environment. The terms with which I try to name and define this very special sphere of our human nature, the superworld, within us, are not the result of a random coincidence. They have long been considered and understood as interrelated, they lead to each other. In this sense, words like spiritual and spiritual in the context of this text should outgrow their being cliches or abducted abstract concepts and take on flesh in a concrete sense in its true sense in the analyses, in the reasoning and in the examples. My interest in the symbolic level of our overworld is related to questions such as do mothers and fathers really exist or are they merely symbolic cultural constructs, to what extent the fact that they are also symbolically culturally constructed makes them non-existent, empirically existent, or else existing in a very particular way, which, without ceasing to be empirical, is at the same time, super-empirical. And if this super-empirical cultural symbolic level of our self-awareness of symbolic images such as mother, father, family, nation, or native region, can also be defined as empirically existent, and as an important factor for our human activity which has direct consequences, including often physical ones, then the question arises whether the same applies to the collective symbolic images of the human imagination, such as dragons and nymphs, the three musketeers, Don Quixote, Romeo and Juliet's love, flying saucers and godmen, superheroes, do they also empirically exist, in what plan and to what extent and does their existence lead to significant changes and consequences, including physical ones, in the human world? And if they exist, how do they exist, can we see them and with which organ, can we meet them on the street, can they physically kill us or miraculously transform us truly, including bodily, with miracles such as resurrection or rebirth? These are the main questions of this book, and they are essential because they are also questions of our future survival as beings endowed with human qualities. The complication of communication in the course of our historical development, repeated also in our individual life path, also leads to the emergence of superrealities, or, mentally alive symbolic systems, which have unlocked significant deviations, 
bifurcations in the course of communication with a context of cultural values codes. Changes in communications become the basis for the emergence of a new type of humanizing qualities. And they transform individuals into human beings of a new kind. Because they radically change our collective mentally constructed socio-cultural superworld, we can also define them as human transforming revolutions in communication. In a cultural historical and in an individual biographical aspect, the essential changes in communication with evaluative symbols are built up in several successive stages. Upbringing in a family through verbal language. Syncretic folk art as an art for collective sharing of empathetic cathartic moral feelings by talking about magical worlds and by acting them out in a ritualized prototheater. The emergence of the author's fiction and literature, and alongside them, of statehood and civilization, who encoded their values and conceptual models in sacred books ideals, which in turn opened the way for cosmopolitan communication in networks with common human causes beyond civilizations. In this regard, the book, Cultural Transformations and Revolutions in Communication, History of the Invisible to the Eyes, is a combination, series of four different parts, each of which has a complete character, but at the same time, in order to understand the next one, it is necessary to read the previous one. The parts, or books, track respectively. Cultures and Society, The Invisible World of Man, Theoretical considerations for the approach to the study of the human soul and spiritual, psychically cultivated, superworld. 2. Revolutions of oral communication, the birth of culture as a collective psyche, the meaning and need for, the child within us, from speech and education to folklore and religion. 3. Revolutions of literature, the civilizing cultures of society, formation of civilization as nostalgia and reverie of the ideal of persons institutions, from the first author's poetry to the first printed fiction book. 4. Promise beyond civilizations, the culture of the cultured. Development of visionary ideas of cosmopolitanism beyond the borders of civilizations, of humanity and of universal human values, of the earth as a common home of all living beings which spread both as mass ideologies and as innovative forms of international communication in networks of individuals sharing common causes increasingly intensively developed from the first printing technology to internet connectivity. The study of the history of the invisible in the human world, as the basis of cultural transformations and revolutions in communication, follows the creative task of situating itself in a modest but original way in the developing traditions of the sciences of the hard-to-know. It can also give them its own contribution, based on a different, southeastern European angle in the search for hypotheses for universally significant issues, for our immeasurably complex mental and spiritual superworld. Research limitations. In any case, the superrealities in our human world remain more than real, and also in a certain aspect, unreal, unrealized projects for the future. That they are both processes and dreams, however does not make them any less essential factors in our world than if they were objects or machines. And the fact that they have not yet happened, or at least not completely happened, does not make them simple and foreseeable, but in fact, much more complicated than if they were simple, finished, facts. At the same time, they also retain the character of dreams, visions images of the imagination and ghostly presences of the nascent, the unformed and the vague, which are not objectified and refuse to obey the strict laws of the actual, because they are something more than it, invisible cultural hyperrealities. However, or perhaps because of this, they also contain enormous energy, completely palpable and often dangerous. Their complexity makes their hierarchy polycentric, and their incompleteness makes their classification contingent, for the presence of dream images flashes and disappears like quarks, is fluid like water, and is fickle like its clusters. And along with that it is overlapping in complex organic structures, invisible but in synergy and in a network of correspondences, just like metabolism and just like tissues and just like physiology in living organisms. Polycentric are complex systems with subsystems, that is, with more than one center. They can be with three centers of government like the Roman Tetrarchy or like modern democracies with different sources of power, legislative, executive, judicial, and perhaps also media. Or they may have seven equally central subsystems as in vertebrate organisms, respectively, locomotor, respiratory, 
circulatory, nervous, excretory, reproductive, and endocrine system. In the case of cultural systems, the centers are correspondingly much more than seven and, for a number of reasons, cannot be precisely enumerated. At the same time, they probably also include all possible types of polycentric structures, which are also overlapping, starting from the so-called topographic knot of interweaving, for example, between real, imaginary and symbolic, or between social, economic and natural spheres, or between body, spirit and soul, see page, go through stratification, as in forest ecosystems, or like the flaws in the house of our cultivation, CP, and we get to the fractals, the family tree of evolutionary processes or to the hologram principle and the internal inscription of the cultural spheres into each other, like the scales of the onion, as Hofstede defines them. The complex polycentric systems of the invisible cultural heritage, intangible and indeterminate or semi-material and semi-determinate, despite their strange character of unfinished processes, projects, also build a hypercomplex network of exact, or almost exact and semi-exact, correspondences in which there is an intensely dynamic exchange of values, intertwined on a horizontal and vertical level, but also completely non-linear, see, for example, Figno, on page. Their incessant, moral value cultural metabolism, works, in perfect synergy, that is, in total simultaneity of the entire organic fabric, or network, of all interdependent and interwoven processes and correspondences in them. This is also due to their symphonicness, which also implies synonymy in some of the cultural living symbols, for example, affection, and love, or villainy, and evil, are synonyms, which, however, are different superrealities, artifacts of the invisible, as well as the partial overlap of some of the cultural value-moral concepts, for example, mentality, ethics, customs, and mentality, or language, and speech, logic, logos, and thought, or citizenship, and nationality. Civilization, civilization, and civilization, or else apocrypha, and holy writings, or civil rights, and civil duties, poetry, fiction, and epic, or moral philosophy, and religion, or artistic word, and scientific word. This is because the invisible human superreality is more like the artistic reality of a work of literature than the engineering reality of the precise combination and location of the particular features of a particular machine. However, the mental superrealities of our civilizations and cultures are not charics and do not have a definite place. They are rather overlapping and fluid like the images in the tale of the three brothers and the golden apple or like the figures in the poem, To My First Lib, by Christo Boat. Indeed, in many ways the invisible superreality of the cultural context is akin to what literary scholars call artistic reality. It is sufficient that by works of art we also understand thought, ideas, thoughts, morals, feelings, faith, religions, inventions, machines, computers, information systems, transport links, government institutions, the rule of law, laws and citizenship, commerce and the economy. Even when they are apparently visible, like the laptop on which I am writing this text, they are in essence invisible superrealities, things that happened and did not happen, realized fantasies and impossible dreams, projects for the future. My laptop today is not only a visible surface of invisible processes, the result of human genius, selectivity and inspiration, will, discipline and work. It is actually also a blueprint for a future more advanced laptop that doesn't exist yet, but is on the way. Or maybe not even for a laptop, but for something else, even more significant and even more invisible, for example, a future, artificial intelligence or another unimaginable machine that at this moment we still cannot even imagine what will it be. Just as today's democracy is a blueprint for a future more developed democracy or a more complex social system that we cannot even imagine what it will be like. And as today's man is a process along the path of daydreaming and self-projection of the future humanity of men. Our humanity and our democracy and our information technology in this sense are equally invisible artistic reality from the world of human dreams, desires and daydreams. And at the same time, creative works of our imagination and dreams have been realized. But if we accept that ethics, representative democracy, computer systems or electricity supply our artistic realities, then we have to ask ourselves whether we cannot also call them musical realities or, for example, theatrical realities. 
this will be as true as if they were an artistic reality. Perhaps it is more accurate to call them in such a case, creative reality, poetic reality. Because they are the invisible, the superreal recreation of the world through human autopoiesis, that is, self-creation, in communication with a cultural context. Thus, from the poetic, that is, from creativity, arises our human superworld, the reason for the appearance of the planetary anthroposphere, together with the functions of its biocultural, ultra-ecological physiology, and together with the qualitative revolutionary changes and with the threats it brings to life on Earth. In this context, the search for the invisible cultural heritage is also a touch on the paradox, this is the man. Man, as well as democracy, is an unfulfilled project, both accomplished and unaccomplished, an opportunity that has been realized and at the same time has not been realized, yet. But despite this, and precisely because of this, each one of us has the potential to realize his own project for man, inside himself, of flesh and blood, through his personal life. Maybe not completely, but at least partially. And maybe not for the entire time of our existence, but at least for a moment. This cannot happen, however, even for a moment, without the cultural context of our interaction with others, which we have inherited from the past and are called upon to transmit into the future, by recreating and embodying it in our relationship with all, oral, written and networked. But the, everything, that has emerged through human history is hardly the most suitable object for research, be it transdisciplinary. No matter how much we limit our tasks, goals, and approach, it will still remain unexhausted. On the other hand, if the totality of our culture is not analyzed, we will not be able to understand the meaning of any of its individual details, as it is part of a huge system-working superorganism of our soul and spirit, personal social, biocultural human superworld. In such a case, a paradox is reached in relation to any attempt to understand cultures, namely, in their entirety, they are unfathomable, and without knowledge of their integrity, no conclusions can be drawn about their segments either. Perhaps this is one of the reasons for the sad fact that cultural systems have very rarely been empirically analyzed in their entirety. Pioneers in this regard are authors such as Ammond and Varber, Claude Levi Strauss, Fernand Braudel, Heert Hofstede, and Jared Diamond. Faced with the paradox of fundamental unknowability for the most complex dynamic system in our known universe, human culture, the researcher must either give up knowledge, such as deny that such knowledge exists at all, or try to look towards the infinite, despite that the mind's eye cannot grasp it. The second choice is related to the rejection of the divine complex, the claim to omniscience, and the arrogance of the intellect, which refuse to recognize both the limitations of nature and its own limitation. The hypercomplex should be approached with corresponding scientific modesty. It should include at a minimum, an acknowledgement of the limitations of the possibilities of research, and also an attempt at maximum correctness and non-falsifiability with respect to what is nevertheless researched. The refusal to lie includes, in addition to the recognition that we know that we know nothing, also verification, checking whether at least what we claim is not a lie. But in the case of the study of the real unreal, or unreal real, almost but not quite real superworld of the invisible in man, the question of whether a statement is false or true has another dimension besides the empirical one, namely, whether the truth of our culture that we proclaim is authentic, whether it has an authentic origin. How could any statement about Chinese, or Japanese, or Indian, or Arab Persian, civilization have an authentic origin if the researcher himself was not brought up from a young age in this cultural tradition, if he was not its bearer, organic part of it? For a European, this can only happen if he is bicultural, if he has fully assimilated and accepted within himself, preferably from a young age, both civilizational traditions, Chinese and European. Otherwise, the European will only be able to retell what was written by other authors whom he trusted that they were not lying, including because they were authentic. For example, in this respect we can trust the Chinese writer Lin Newton with much greater reason when he analyzes the life and soul of his people, than we can a North American geopolitical or business analyst, a German traveler, a Russian cabinet Chinaist or in French intellectual snob, in Oxford arrogant know-it-all with imperial self-confidence, or in the brief statistical notes on Chinese history in the Encyclopedia Britannica. The researcher can be sure of the adequacy of the verification of his or her claims only in relation to his, 
her own cultural tradition, of which he is she is an authentic bearer. From here comes the last, but not insignificant, limitation in the study of communication with a cultural context, in this case, the Southeastern European one. Paradoxically, on the brink of extinction, for us descendants of Southeast Europeans, the future is before us to a greater degree than most historical periods so far, we can create it so that we survive or disappear forever, but in any case we also have a cultural and civilizational duty not to disappear without a trace like the legendary Atlanteans, but like the ancient Egyptians to leave a mark on the unique contribution and Balkan perspective of the rest of the human civilizational traditions. This can be done not with a view of Southeast Europe from an unclear, universalist, perspective, but with a Southeast European view from the Balkans towards man and his humanity in our planet, a common home. The study of cultural invisibility, without renouncing classical scientific standards and scientific popularization, is somewhat experimental, on the border of scientificity. It lays out and tests the adequacy of a specific innovative methodological matrix of a transdisciplinary approach to culture and communication within the paradoxical systemist, quantum, logic of the new holistic scientific paradigms. At the same time, it argues and demonstrates a new author's point of view to communication in a cultural context with symbols that are potential, projective and processual, giving human qualities to man, under-realized systemic overrealities of mentally cultivated dichotomies and balances that are simultaneously not fully real, they are completely real and more than real as well. These two tasks, to set out, argue and demonstrate a methodological framework, and to present, justify, and analyze an unusual thesis, determine the nature of the book, which is focused more on explaining, arguing, and testing methodology and related thesis than on exhaustive analysis of empirical data. In this respect, the book is most like Edgar Morin's method, such as the entire theoretical first part. At the same time, the book also contains analyzes mainly of specific Southeastern European symbolic system superrealities known to us, looked at from a new angle. But these analyses cannot be comprehensively developed here, without seriously increasing the volume of the work to the point of multi-volume and thus shifting the semantic emphasis. Therefore, the analyses are primarily illustrative in nature, they illustrate the applicability of the tested theoretical model and the adequacy of the stated thesis according to the criteria of the proposed methodological framework. Cultural tradition and communication. There is no culture that does not rely on communication. It is the fundamental process of every socio-cultural system and of every human transformation, of every moral value transformation. The emphasis of the study of the superworld of the invisible in us is the processes of individual and subjective communication in empathy, which forms concrete communities of individuals, and not so much its results, the large framework of public communications. It is precisely the direct communication between specific persons who empathize with meaning-making symbols, capable of inspiring their minds and exciting their feelings to the point of permanently uniting them in a union, that we can define as communion. The term, culture, comes from the Latin translation of the ancient Greek word, paideia means conduct, good manners, education. In ancient Athens, the concept of paideia referred to the education and training of children, but later the school of Neoplatonism gave it a wider meaning, the care we take for the soul. Cicero decided to translate this word with a term borrowed from agriculture, cultura in Latin means ennobling, cultivating the varieties of plants, the soils, the animal species, tilling the land so that there is fertility. Cicero's understanding of culture is in the spirit of the Platonic culture anime, cultivation of the spirit. Culture is a complex organic system that is at the same time superorganic, or rather, superorganic. In their communicative context, cultural systems cannot be seen as an object or a statistical given. Cultures are a living process, a process of change, communication and appreciation through language. Communications are the main life process in cultural systems, with a foundation, concrete interpersonal individual and group communication. And the balance between different types of cultural communications can be defined with the term, ecology of the cultural system. In the state social systems in civilizations, communications have gradually developed as extremely diverse, commercial, production, military, transport, power, political, administrative, class, international, 
unilateral, bilateral, complex, simplified and complex. The complex communication that creates a social and emotional connection between people is unique to culture. Moral cultural transformations with the potential to give rise to human communities are also based on it. It is these that we define with the concept of community. And communication in a cultural context creates the basic values, concepts and ideas in the human superworld, which are also paradigmatic, patterns transmitted through the memory of the community and assimilated through the cultural tradition, initially determining the way of thinking, feeling and sensory perception of reality. The difference between communication and empathic communication is that the latter is an intensely integrative deep level of interpersonal and group subjective interaction that is both intimate, holistically binding, socio-forming and establishing cultural norms and patterns. It often takes place in immediacy, does not necessarily aim to transmit informational data, nor to end after the completion of a certain task, and takes place in development, in a non-ending process as an exchange and joint experience of symbols cultural values. From this point of view, public communications are mainly of interest to us insofar as they are a factor in the formation of individual, at the level of mental life, value systems and cultural patterns to follow. The analysis is directed more towards communication as an unfinished and unfinished dynamic process of self-realization, as a type of mentality and not so much towards the socio-economic status quo and the materializing results of standardized communications. In other words, in a telephone conversation, for example, or in an electronic chat, we will be more interested in the content of the conversation as a development and as an interrelationship between people, which is able to form a joint community from them. Therefore, research is not so much interested in the characteristics of the telephone or the finances and corporate organization of the telephone company, nor the mobile device or the algorithm of the servers through which this communication takes place, unless they have a direct impact on the individual psyche and on the quality of interpersonal relationships. Another specificity of the analysis is the consideration of culture as a complex organic system, which is in a constant and never-ending process of recreation, upgrading and value exchange, in an empathic and caric communication in sympathy. Communication revolutions are due to crises in communication. As Karl Marx and Roan Tom also claimed, each in their own field of knowledge, without crises no revolutionary situation occurs, and without a revolutionary situation no revolutions occur. Like all other crises and revolutions, communication revolutions have ambiguous and contradictory consequences, some neutral, others negative, others positive for the human biopsychosociocultural world. The most negative consequence is the collapse of human communication. But it is precisely this collapse that gives rise to the need for innovations in communication and its development at a more complicated, more sophisticated and higher level, i.e. negatives are a prerequisite for positive development, and for the emergence of new forms of communication and communication between people, which build on the old ones and thus complicate and enrich them. In this sense, the study of human cultures and communication with a cultural context also represents an entry into the world of the invisible, the non-obvious. The invisible is the cultural context, the world of the human soul, that is, logos, ethos and pathos, mind, moral values and a heart overflowing with feelings, and the world of the human spirit, upbringing, imagination, will, dreams, connections bridges to others and actions. These worlds together in their indivisible whole constitute the socio-cultural world of man. This world is not static, but a process, a never-ending process of communication, with oneself, with others, with the world. The collapse of this communication, at all three levels, leads to degradation, crisis or collapse of socio-cultural reality, which is equal to dehumanization, dehumanization of individuals and societies. For without the communal shared spiritual reality, man is no longer man, for it is his soul and spirit and his heartfelt communion with others that make him a fully human being. We know of no more complex ecosystem than human culture, our collective psyche. Culture and psyche are two sides of the same thing, arising from the transmission of experience between parent and child, as well as between individuals of the social group, due to the need to foster social bonding in feelings of affection and empathy. Since culture is a complex organic system, to understand it, we need to understand the principles of complex systems. A strained balance of opposites. Incomplete symmetry. 
indivisibility, unpredictability, independence, selective value-separated semipermeability, reproduction,